to his time uh, at Georgia. We had a long conversation because we knew it was going to be a process for him to learn the amount of work that goes into this, even in the summertime, the working with other guys, like there's nowhere to rest. Like when you're on the court or you're in the weight room, you're working. And, and, and the one thing I said to him, and I, and I think it stayed true through this whole thing, because it was different for me. I'd had one guy that had really come in predestined uh, in the sense of Cody Zeller. The rest of the guys that I'd had, guys like Dwayne Wade, Victor Aladipo, uh, Wesley Matthews, OG Ananobi, all those kind of guys, they were not predestined to be one of the top picks in the draft per se. And, and as I said to him, there will be more people trying to find reasons why you shouldn't be number one and why you're not worthy of being number one, then there will be people trying to find reasons that you are just because of the way you're coming in, just because of the accolades that he's coming in with. It's much easier to go after something that's at the top of the ladder than it is the people that are climbing their way up. I said, you've got to be a climber every day. You've got to continue to work and understand that you've got to hold yourself to a really, really high standard because people will be looking to pick it apart, not just build it up. I said, but in here, we're going to build it up every day. We're going to work together. And I said, that means that there'll be a lot of tough days that you've got to get through, that you've got to overcome. And for an 18-year-old that should have been a senior in high school and never been through anything like that, I think he handled it extremely well. And he became uh, an even better teammate than what I could have imagined, considering all those accolades. He, he said this last night, too. You know, he really learned to move without the basketball. He never had to move without the basketball. You know, he lived slot to slot and top of the key. And then he could get to the rim from there. I mean, he could get anything he wanted done on the basketball court during his high school days. And that just wasn't going to be the case anymore. And it's certainly not going to be the case now in the NBA. So that level of awareness, that level of, of uh, aptitude of looking at things, being able to learn, wanting to learn, all that is there. And he just needs people that are going to invest that time into him constantly. Because the last time he's been in a, and a, and a film session uh, was March 12th. And then midway through, we found out we weren't playing anymore. So I know, he's, I, obviously, he's watched film. But I'm talking about in a team setting. So as long as that, as that happens and that time is spent with him, you're going to see him continue to grow and, grow and flourish uh, and build onto that level of intelligence and build onto that awareness. We'll next go to Chip Towers, followed by Jacob Roth with Channel 46 in Atlanta. Um, I, I just wonder if you can uh, quantify what this means for Georgia basketball in terms of uh, recruiting and stuff. And, and would you – will you continue to pursue players like Ant-Man that are sort of uh, predestined? Well, absolutely. I, I think you have to. I think anybody that says they wouldn't is not telling the truth. I mean, you've got to try to make your team better – uh, on the floor, in the classroom, in the meetings every day, where well, you've got to keep trying to do it in recruiting as well. And I think it means a ton. I mean, when you really look at it and say that the last time the highest pick was Dominique Wilkins at number three, 38 years ago, and it, that's just amazing. And, and to never had a number one pick. And, and um, I think it says a lot. I think it, it, it's going to say even more in the sense that if, if your dreams are real, uh, if your agenda is real, Okay, and this is what you really want, and you want to come in and and you want to help build a place up uh, that it can happen here. And there's sometimes there's different agendas in recruiting. There's different things people want, and and but at the end of the day, if you want to get better, and if you want to be developed, and if you want a chance to play in a great university in front of a great fan base, it's here. And there's no one that can ever say again that your greatest dream couldn't be realized. Uh, at Georgia when it comes to being able to go on to the next level. And um, I, I feel really good about that. And we will continue to pursue in the state. Um, I've had a couple of great conversations already this morning uh, with kids in this state. Maybe, hopefully they weren't interrupting their Zoom classroom sessions too much, but we still had those conversations and last night. And, and it's all right here. And you just have to be willing to put in the time. And we've got to get We've got to get enough guys that, that can make each other better on a continual basis so we can build some consistency into the program. Hey, Coach. So as one of those kind of predestined guys, you know, Anthony's obviously been the guy pretty much his whole basketball career. And I know obviously you shared the ball a lot last year with him at UGA. But he said last night he doesn't really feel a lot of pressure playing with two all-stars. So what, 
What do you think about his game? Uh, he'll be able to kind of unlock playing alongside, you know, Carl Anthony Towns and D'Angelo Russell. Well, I think also when you add Ricky Rubio and the energy that he plays with and, and the passing ability, uh, Ricky is the epitome of the old quote, the ball finds energy. And, and I'm a huge, my, my son's favorite player, non dad coach player has always been Ricky Rubio. So we've followed him close for a long, long time. And I just love the way he moves the ball. I love his work ethic. I think that was one of the best moves of the entire night that anybody in the NBA made. So to me, I think that helps. I, I think Anthony will continue to learn what it means to move without the basketball. As we've said, he became our best screener at the end of the year because he loved to see his teammates get free. And I don't know how much screening, you know, Ryan will do in the high post or things like that, but Anthony is a teammate. I mean, he's a teammate and there's not really a, uh, well, I'll be a teammate in this. I won't be a teammate in that. He's not really like that. You know, this kid is a teammate. He's, he's, he's got an infectious personality. People want to be around him. Does he have to grow up? Uh, absolutely. Does he have to work through mistakes? Absolutely. Does he have a lot to learn? No question about it. But he's 19 with a great heart, tremendous empathy, and loves being a teammate. So to me, those kind of things are really going to work well. And if Carl uh, will take him under his wing, and if D'Angelo, who I've known for a long, long time, will take him under his wing with, with some of the other guys that are in his life uh, it, it, that he has the capacity now to have in the NBA, it's going to work. But, but he needs to learn, like any 19-year-old would need to learn, what it truly means to be a professional. Not just be a pro basketball player, but what it means to be a professional. And that's the greatest hope that I have when it comes to the mentoring phase of what he gets from his teammates. Because, because that's what he needs. And if that happens over the next couple of years, look out. You know, because there's so much there. He just needs to learn now what that game and what that life is all about. We'll know, but next go back to Minneapolis for Darren Wolfson with KSTP TV, followed by John Krasinski with The Athletic. Okay. Tom, I appreciate you doing this. As, as we sure. up here in the Twin Cities get to know Anthony in the, in the coming months and years, what, what will surprise us as we get to learn about Anthony? What will surprise us about Anthony? What will surprise you? That, you know, I, I think once people get to know him, I've said this, so it's no surprise to me. But, I mean, just what kind of personality that he has, how good he is with people. Um, um, he's, he's reserved in a way. He's not the class clown. He's not trying to be the life of the party. Uh, he's funny naturally. He has a lot of fun. Um, but I think as his confidence grows as a player, I think you won't be surprised when you see him doing things that are not for the camera. Okay. You know, as well as I do in, in the professional level, uh, a lot of the good things that happen are followed by a camera crew or they're followed by somebody monitoring it and take it. And, and, and so they can put it on social media. I've seen Anthony do things. I've seen Anthony be with people because it's natural to him that no camera is involved in. And one of the great things about him, and we had numerous NBA people, not only at the games last year, but at practice. So it was, it was nothing to have two, maybe three GMs at a practice, have eight, nine, 10 different teams at a practice. I can't name one day that that ever faced him. There was not one day. Now there were days that we had to get him better or we had to work through things. I'm not saying that, but when it comes to, I ever had to worry about him trying to put on a show for an NBA GM or, or an NBA team, that never happened. He's very, very confident in who he is. So I say that to say this, when, when he, he wants to help people, he's got a very, very good heart. And I think people will have an answer to your question over the next few years, you'll hear about stories about, well, Anthony did this, or Anthony said that, or Anthony did this for this family or Anthony did this at this restaurant. He just got to grow into that. And, 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 and he's got to be reminded of it. That's who he is. He's a great teammate with a great heart, and it's got to come out all the time. Hey, Tom, building off that just a little bit, uh, he, he spent a lot of time, you know, most of his life in Atlanta in the Georgia area. How do you see him acclimating to a new city, to kind of just a, a different lifestyle? We've seen some prospects kind of, have difficulties making that adjustment others are seamless how do you see him kind of just changing the the environment around him that way 
Well, that'll be an adjustment. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. I lived in the Midwest all my life. And then when we left Indiana, we moved to Florida. And then a year later, took the Georgia job. And I'm in my 50s, right? I'm 54. It's, a, it's an adjustment. So there's no question that that will be that way for him. And, and, but as long as, you know, my recommendation to him would be to live as close to the facility as he can be, because he's going to spend time in the gym. Uh, he's going to spend time with his video games. You know, he's, he's, he's a guy, he's, he's very resourceful in that way. Um, I think he'll be fine with that. I think he'll be fine. I, I think now the way the season is going to play out, there's not going to be a lot of time to get acclimated other than to basketball, you know, with the season starting as quick as it's going to start. And I think that's a really good thing for him in the sense of right now, this is what my job is. This is what I've got to do. And then the travel starts and all those types of things. And I think it'll be really good for him as he gets to know another part of the country, you know, and then really diving into what Minnesota is all about and, and getting to know the city and all those type of things. There'll be time for that. But right now it's much more important that he dive in to understand, man, this season's here quicker than I thought it would be, and I've got to be ready. We'll next go to Mike Griffith, followed by Mark Bradley for a question or an astute observation. Ah, um, so Dwayne Wade was talking last night about spending a couple hours watching film with you last season at some point, uh, looking at, uh, I guess he looked at Ant-Man, and then also he talked about uh, Anthony comparing himself to to Dwayne and, and Dwayne was flattered and, and pleased with that. But obviously you coached both guys. I mean, that's, it's the most obvious question out there comparing Anthony to Dwayne Wade. And then if you could just elaborate more on your time with Wade uh, breaking down film in Athens, whenever that was, he was talking. Yeah. About I, I think, I think with, uh, I think with Dwayne, you know, Dwayne is a kind person. Dwayne's going in the hall of fame on the first ballot, probably unanimous. Right. And so I think anytime uh, that's just Dwayne being Dwayne. But Dwayne has had a special interest in Anthony uh, for some time. There's no doubt about it. Because his son, Zaire, uh, has known him for some time. They play in the Pangos camp together out in California or different AAU events. So Dwayne has been acclimated to that scene because of his son, because of Zaire. So uh, he was well aware. And then obviously when he comes with me, he's even that much more aware. But I don't think the comparisons are even remotely fair to either one of them. And so like what what – because – they both come up different ways. I mean, Dwayne had very few scholarship offers. Anthony was predestined from, you know, ninth grade, 10th grade on. So it, it's just a completely different deal. But when it comes to the level of care that they have for people, when it comes to what kind of teammates they are, when it comes to what kind of work ethic that they have, um, when it comes to not taking themselves too serious, on the basketball floor and engaging themselves to teammates. Now taking themselves serious as basketball players, but not taking themselves too serious as star players when it comes to their teammates, which is by far the most important thing. And then being coachable, right? Then being coachable. We had a lot of tough days with Dwayne Wade too. Just nobody saw him because it, nobody really knew about him, especially that first year that he sat out. There were a lot of tough days, but those are the days that shaped him and we had him for three years. So it's just different, but uh, because of Dwayne's interest level in, in me and in us and in Anthony and in the business side of it, because Dwayne obviously has got a huge part of where he's at with shoes and is, is going to be able to do whatever he wants in the NBA, whether it's ownership, uh, management, whatever he wants to do, there's a special interest. So anytime that he could pick things up on television or anytime that he could pick things up watching game tape, he would point that out. And, and he's done it with other guys. And I think that's, that's one of the beauties of, of what we have, you know, in, in, in our relationships. And uh, a lot of schools are always talking about, well, pro this and pro that. And I've got this guy and I've got that guy. Well, that's great. But if they're not really helping you make your team better, then it becomes, it's, it's not as great. And Dwayne has been the proponent from the beginning. And this has been so big for us. Uh, whether we were at Marquette, whether we were at Indiana, or now at Georgia. Dwayne is the leader of the family. When you look at all the former players that have gone on, I, I, I can't name very many that he didn't reach out to on his own because, it all, because he knew that it was, we were all connected. Even though he never went to Indiana, he never went to Georgia, he knew we were all connected. And I would put Magic Johnson's like that at Michigan State, okay? And, and it didn't matter who the coach was, whether it was Judd Heathcote or Tom Izzo, he was going to 
dive into that, those relationships. We had a couple guys like that at Indiana, but not to the extent of what Dwayne Wade has done with me on that, of really, really caring about how those guys' futures go. And then, and then being able to help be a sounding board for them in the NBA. And uh, that's what it was. And I think Dwayne will continue to do that as, uh, as long as he can. And I think that's great. And then I guess just a quick follow-up, Coach. Obviously, Georgia had some tough losses last year. Um, can you just talk about Anthony's resiliency? Because you guys were able to bounce back from some of your worst losses with some of your best wins, beating teams like Tennessee and Auburn by double digits. How much of that was Anthony, and how well does that play when he goes to a franchise like the, the Timberwolves that had such a poor record last year? Well, Scott Layden and I talked about that at length, and, and because – the difference between uh, Anthony and some other guys near the top of the board is Anthony went through and he could have made the other choices too, right? He could have gone to Europe. He could have, he could have sat it out, all those types of things. No, this guy not only stayed home, but he went through it, right? He went through it. He had to bounce back from tough, tough days. He had to bounce back uh, from tough games. He had to come and bring it day after day. And, and, and then he had to be, you know, when there were good games, he had to know, turn around, no, no, we're not taking tomorrow off. We're not, we're not just walking through for 20 minutes, all right, and hanging out and getting a massage. Then, no, we're going to practice. So, like, he's been through the rigors of it and at the age of 18. And I think that really helps him because, obviously, the NBA season is going to be longer and there's going to be way more games. But he's, but he's not going to have to walk in and not have any idea how to practice hard after a game or have any idea how to put back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back practices together. He's not going to – that's there for him, right? And, 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 and then it's up to the coaching staff to find the best way to utilize that, to get the most out of him. And, and Ryan and I will talk about that when we visit. But the bottom line is he loves the game. He loves to get better. He learned a lot about what it takes to be a, a worker on a team and not just a guy that works really hard on his own and how to bring the most out of his teammates. And, that, and that's what I'm proud of him for, because um, it was tough. I mean, there, there, there weren't as many lanes. We shot 28% from three in the league. We shot 30% overall, that, and we missed some open threes. I mean, he had to do a lot of different things, scoring-wise, driving-wise. I think this will go back to Darren's question about what will people be surprised on. I think the basketball part, they'll be surprised on is how good a passer that he is. And when they see that level, you know, over, over the next few years and when they see where that happens. And as long as everybody remembers that it's a, it's, it's a marathon and not a sprint here with a kid like this that, that, that's 19 and, and going to play the entire season at 19, I think it'll all be fine. But, but he's, he's resilient in the fact that he learned day after day, we weren't backing down, we weren't backing off, and this is what it's going to take for you to be successful. And he, and he responded to that. He embraced it. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, this may be an inappropriate question, Tom, Mike, because it's not necessarily about Anthony. In fact, it's not about Anthony. But am I, am I allowed to ask a coach about you're, you're getting close to going now, but the COVID numbers are, are, are spiking upward again. Um, how confident are you that there's going to be a basketball season? And if so, what do you think it's going to look like? Well, that's a good question. I think, I think what this time period is, you, you have to be extremely flexible and versatile as a coach and be able to adjust, obviously, right? But I think in this day and age now, it's taught even more of that. And, if, 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 you know, we've had numerous COVID cases already on our team and our staff going back to the summertime. And so, and now we're testing three times a week. You know, there's, now when I get that message in the morning, okay, everything was negative. Uh, you know, you breathe, I, I don't want to say you breathe a sigh of relief, but it's not a lot different right now if you get the message that so-and-so is positive because you just have to be able to adjust. And I think in answer to your question, I think we have to be flexible. Um, it, am I confident that it's going to go the whole way? I don't think anybody could even remotely look anybody in the, in the eye and say that they are. But do you have to plan like it is? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you don't, you don't walk into any given day, Mark, and say, well, you know, we might only get to play X amount of games or we might get to do this. You, you try to follow what you see in the news. You try to follow what the numbers are. 
I hear again already this week, uh, the guidelines have changed. Now it's the 15 minutes cumulative rather mm -hmm. than just the 15 minutes in one situation. We knew that was coming. We had a meeting yesterday. We put together uh, another sheet. Okay, how do we really take the next step in monitoring that in practice? Two weeks ago, rather than, and in answer to your question like this, two weeks ago, rather than just have coaches spread people out, we put X's six feet apart all along the baseline and sidelines all along the court. Because now rather than having coaches, okay, move over here, move over there. No, just get to an X, just get to an X. And, and that's how we have to do it. So you're making your adjustments constantly. And if we miss games, if we have people missing games, if we get shut down for a period of time, we're going to have to make that adjustment too. And I think the whole key is it starts with me as, in, as a leader of the team that if I show any frustration or panic, then why should I be upset if anybody else does? Because they're already feeling the frustration of, of not knowing what's coming. They're already nervous. I see it in my own children, right? Because we're all in this world where we don't, we're doing our best to control it, but there's a lot of times we can't control it. And, and, and again, I got a dose of this uh, when Tom Izzo got COVID because I know how diligent he is. You know, I know how, Anal he is in the sense of, okay, this is what we're going to do and we're not deviating from it. And for him to have no true idea how he got it and for me to believe it and listen to him describe it, that's just another dose. Like there, it, it's, it's uncontrollable and we just got to do everything we can possibly do to control it. And then if it happens again, we just deal with it and we don't let anybody panic. Thank you. So you're welcome. I wish I had a better answer, but I mean, there's just, there's just no way to know, you know, and, and until they say we're not playing, yeah, until they say we're not playing next Wednesday, um, everything's geared towards that. And, and then we just, but I do think it's given you some really good teaching and coaching moments in your practice because these guys don't know, are we going to play three in a row at some point in time? Are we going to go two weeks without a game? Nobody knows. Right. So you can't have any bad days in practice because you're 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 building for something that you don't know what's coming and so we've got to have everything we can possibly have covered covered and we can't look back and say well you know that didn't work out for us but we really wa wasted that day and this day so i think it's given us even more urgency in our coaching to make sure that the the days go really well when we're together thanks Bill. you're welcome We'll go back uh, to Minneapolis where uh, Chris Hine with the Star Tribune and I believe Jace Frederick from the Pioneer Press has another question. Okay. Hi, hey, Tom. I'm wondering um, what was maybe the biggest growth you saw in Anthony uh, from the time you started recruiting him to, to now, um, whether it be on the court or, or off the court? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I, he was here for one of our first official practices. He'd come to town to go to the dentist. And he came to practice and it was just awesome, right? Like I was, I was down near emotional when he walked in cause I hadn't seen him and we'd FaceTimed and talked, but we like hadn't been in present with one another and he came and he watched the practice and I just kept looking over. He was so dialed in. Now he got his cane, his raising canes, fried chicken delivered. So he could sit there with his, his chicken and his, his French fries. And he's a French fry nut. That's going to have to change a little bit, but, but, He's sitting there and, and, and eating, but he's so dialed into practice, right? And I'm talking to him through practice. Well, then I had him when we started to scrimmage, get up with the coaches. And, and, and he was into it, right? Like he was into it. He was participating. And then the thing, Chris, that I thought was so cool, afterwards, practice ends, okay? He goes out there and he rebounds for his teammates, his ex-teammates for like 45 minutes. He's not shooting. He's not in the shooting drills. He's just rebounding for him. He's just passing the ball. Practice is over, um, and they're just in there shooting, right? And he's talking to him, and he's laughing, and it was like he never left. And But I saw, even in that short period of time, I saw a little more seriousness. I could sense the maturity. He was actually taller. You know, he grew an inch while he was between uh, signing here and where he's at now, so he's up to 6'5". But I think – I think he continued to grow. He, he learned a lot. And, and I would say that the area of basketball where he probably grew the most was understanding what was going to be expected of him every day, how hard he had to go every day. And on the court, the actual basketball was moving without the basketball. 
and and being able to cut and 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 uh, and and some of it was play driven, some of it was random driven. Though a lot of our cutting is random driven, but we knew when we got him that he was going to have to truly, truly embrace not having that ball in his hands all the time. And he's still going to have to do that. He's still much more comfortable with the ball, probing the defense, than he is cutting, receiving it off screens, being able to move. But that's going to be part of the growth process that Ryan and the staff will get through to him too. But he matured a lot. And then again, looking at him uh, a few weeks ago, it, I felt really, really good about that. You know, he, he, he's, he's so easy to have a conversation with when there's a trust level and when he knows you. You know, and hopefully you guys get to see that. It takes time. I mean, I'm not going to – I've had a lot of guys going to the NBA. It takes time for them to – not that they don't trust you, but they don't know you, right? And, and, and it just takes time for that. And, but, but you'll see that as you, as you get to know him, and, and you guys are all going to like him a lot. Uh, he's talked a lot about his, you know, how he thinks he can grow defensively, but even on the offensive end, people, you know, looked at his shooting percentages and thought, had some concern with that, but looking at the shots he took and the degree of difficulty on some of those threes, I almost thought the percentage was impressive. Um, with maybe the types of looks he's going to get playing alongside other great offensive players that's facing in the NBA, just how much do you think his, he can ascend even offensively um, at the next level? Oh, he'll get a lot better offensively. He needs to trust the catch and shoot jump shot. Right, young players, and I'm sure you guys see this with young players coming to the NBA, and we get it all the time in college. They predetermine their shots, and Anthony's one of the great predeterminers, right? Like, okay, I'm going to get this step back. I'm going to get this move. I'm going to get that move, and and um, because they they the degree of difficulty doesn't matter to them. They believe they can make it, right? And so many times coming up the ladder, if they didn't make it, they still got to shoot it because. They weren't always responsible and accountable to winning. And as you go up the ladder, um, that changes, right? That changes. But I think for him, the simplicity of it, the catch and shoot part of it, the moving without the ball, they've been able to screen, step back, catch it, rip it, go, catch it, shoot it. Um, he can be very good in the post. There, there, there's so many different things that you can do with him because of athleticism and his size. And then as he gets into an environment, where there's better, we had good spacing, but the spacing dissipated because we weren't shooting the three as well. We, you know, we missed open threes, as did he. He missed some open threes too, but we missed open threes. So all of a sudden, now the defense is playing risk reward and the lane closes up a little bit more. And, and, and there were times that he got back cuts or times we got baskets because he would just flat out be denied, which is probably not going to happen as much in the NBA. And, and he's not going to be denied into a no-catch situation. So I think his offensive game can grow a lot. I think the passing will come out. We didn't bring the ball screen to him. You know, there's a lot for him to learn with the ball screen. So understand this, like we didn't bring that second defender up a lot because they were already in the paint. So we didn't want to bring the second offensive man up there a lot because he had the strength, speed, quickness to beat people, right? To beat his own matchup, right? To get in a downhill drive and not have to navigate that second defender all the time that could, that could create if they were going to clog the lane up. So we do a lot of slip screens and, and downhill drives, you know, pitches, things like that. So he'll get him even better um, education in the ball screen game from Ryan and the staff. I know that. But defensively, you're going to see a guy that when he's locked in with that body, it, it, it'll take a little bit of time. But there will become a time in the NBA where people will be – they will be thinking twice on if they can score against him because I saw it happen in college. He puts that nose in your chest. He gets down and he starts sliding those feet and he uses that wingspan. And you can't get through his chest, right? You can't get through it because he's strong. He's quick. He's got incredible balance, incredible balance moving his feet. And I think that's what's going to help him be an NBA defender very early on. We'll next go to Dane Moore with SB Nation, Minnesota, followed by uh, Jacob Roth with Channel 46 in Atlanta. Hey, Tom, my, my question is actually similar to Jace's, just kind of, I, I think that the narrative that's going to surround here a little bit is, is on his, his three-point shooting numbers because, you know, for one reason or the other, that's what we do. So you brought up the catch-and-shoot element of the game as maybe a reason why that number could jump at the next level, too. 
Also, he, he shot more threes, right, than anybody else in the country, volume-wise. I guess I'm kind of wondering how you see those two things merging at the le- next level and where you ultimately kind of see him winding up as a three-point shooter in, you know. I didn't know, I didn't know about, the, about the number of threes volume-wise. I know with us he did, and he made like, I don't know, 77, 78, 79, whatever it was. We needed it, though. You know, we needed that on this team. You know, my teams at Indiana, over the nine years we were there, we led the power conferences, the power five, and, and three-point percentage at like 38-6, 38-4. And we haven't had that here yet. You know, we haven't had that three-point shooting. My first year we shot 32. Last year we shot 30 and 28 in the league. And so open shots create so many gaps. That was the biggest thing with his shooting is, is getting his catch right, you know, stepping in and really being an aggressive on his catch, Stepping into it one two, and I, I he's made tremendous strides in this uh, with his ability to uh, extend that left foot, and then staying in his shot, you know, which is basically holding his follow through. So many young kids automatically fade. I remember when D'Angelo was young. D'Angelo faded a lot when he didn't have to fade because they shoot their step back or they shoot those shots, and they're not on balance. Well, look how much better D'Angelo is now with his balance. If you went back and reviewed. And not just because he's a Timberwolf, but, but again, because he is, because you see him every day. If you went back and reviewed his shooting, okay, and he's still got a ways to go, but if you reviewed his shooting early to where it is now, they're so much better because of his balance, because of his follow-through. Well, Anthony will be the same way. He, he just, when I use the word trust, it's more take, right? Like, don't just put the ball on the ground. I've got a 23-year-old, 50-year senior right now that we had this conversation last night when we scrimmaged. He wants to put it on the floor every time he catches it. And the other thing that we did with, with, with Anthony, there were two things that I think will serve him well. We've had the NBA line down permanently in, in, our, in our practices uh, since I was at Marquette. And then last year, uh, we put the four-point line down. And I got the idea from Brett Brown, and I'm sure others are doing it, but I got the idea from Brett Brown, and we made our four-point line 33 feet. So when you watch Anthony, he's really, really comfortable being a long way from the bucket in a downhill way. Well, at the same time, that's going to help his range with shooting the three. But the catch and shoot and him trusting and taking that catch and shoot rather than settling for step backs, which when you, when you attack your defender, get him back on his heels, which he's got the strength and mobility to do, and then go up into your step back or your pullback and go straight up, that's a good shot. When you've predetermined your step back and you want to fade away, it's a bad shot. And he's got to continue to grow through that. But the catch and shoot in that offense uh, and the way Ryan plays, uh, I'd be surprised if that didn't make a jump throughout the season as soon as he understands the speed of the game. Make sense? Yes, sir. Thank you. Very helpful. You're welcome. Hey, Coach, I just wanted to ask about uh, Rayshon Hammonds. You know, obviously going undrafted, but uh, according to his agent, he's going to sign with the Pacers. Um, have you had any conversations with him since the draft ended? And then also, uh, what do you think about him maybe spending some time around Victor Oladipo? Well, I had conversations with the Pacers, which was probably more important. I'll talk to Ray today, but it was much more important to talk to the Pacers. And, and I like that situation for him. Uh, to my knowledge, they're not going to bring many rookies to camp. And this gives him a real chance. And uh, Jawan Morgan, I believe last year I had at Indiana, took an Exhibit 10, I think it was an Exhibit 10 with Utah, I think, before it turned into a three-year. So, you know, really at the end of the day, and I think Ray had good interviews, and I think Ray felt good about it. He was here a couple of weeks ago. But all you need is to get in that door. And the fact that the Pacers – only had the one second round pick and he's not Ray Sean's position and that they see a future for him. Uh, I think is really, really important. I've had a couple guys in the past one in particular, I won't name him, but didn't get drafted should have signed with the Pacers. All right. Because of their development system, because of the way it was, he didn't do it. And, and, and it's not just because, because I was at Indiana all those years, I have respect for that organization. And in answer to your question with Victor, if he can be around Victor, in training camp, because Victor's like Dwayne. If, if you're connected to me and to the family, then you're a part of it. And I think he will help him. And I will ask Victor to do that. No question about it. And, and uh, the bottom line is, though, um, they've got a plan for him. And, and, and from what I heard this morning. And to me, that's the most important thing. Uh, there's a good path. 
Um, whether it's the NBA, whether it's the G League, th those, two, those two facilities are really close to one another. They've done a really, really good job with that. And he's going to have an opportunity. And, and, and that's a program that has done a lot with utilizing uh, their two ways or utilizing the G League or, or whatever it is. So I feel that was a really, really good place for him. Thank you. You're welcome. Have time for probably one last question from Tori Heck. Hey, Coach. Um, I watched you and Anthony together, obviously, all of last year, and I think anyone can tell from how you talk about him, the relationship that y'all share. How do you um, let go of someone that you just made such a close bond with, as, bond with as a player and a coach in just one year, and how do you maintain a relationship with him as he moves to the NBA? Well, you know when you get them that if you're doing it right, the relationship's going to last a lot longer than the time they're there, whether they're there four years, five years, or one year. And, and you just, you just mature into that. Right. And, um, as a coach and, uh, it's less emotional when they leave, but it remains an emotion filled relationship because to me, and I've been like this with all of them, right? Like I'm not their present day coach, but I'm always going to be their coach because I'm always going to tell them the truth. I'm always going to try to help them make them better. And most importantly, when they leave, when it comes to the basketball, it's not, well, you should be doing this or he should be doing that. It's, it's not that. It's the reminders, right? It's the reminders of what they are, what they do, what they need to do. And I was, I was doing that with him last night. So to me, it, what, what happens is when you're not afraid to tell them the truth and you're not afraid to help make them better on the court or what they're dealing with in their life. And whether they make the NBA or whether they scored one point a game, right? If that relationship is real, it's going to keep going on. And it picks up right where it left off. But you never, as a coach, are afraid to say something that is going to make them better. Because if you weren't afraid to tick them off and make them better when you coached them, why would you now be afraid to do that when they leave, right? And, th and that's exactly how it is with me. Because that the relationships grow because you do tell them the truth. The relationships grow because you are demanding of them. The relationships grow because you do have hard conversations and you do enjoy successes and go through things together. And, and, and that's what it'll continue to be. So I'm extremely proud of him. And, and the emotional part becomes about, okay, I know what he's like. Uh, I know what his heart is like. I know what his spirit's like. And I got a pretty good idea of what he's capable of when those things get brought out. So to me, that's the bottom line. How can I help make sure that those things get brought out? And that's what I want to do for the Timberwolves. That's what I want to do for the Pacers and all these other guys that I've coached. Thanks, Coach. You're welcome. Thanks, Coach. Uh, appreciate your time. A couple house cleaning items. And it was all this information was at the bottom of the media advisory. But of course, Anthony, as Coach mentioned, was the, uh, the highest pick ever in Georgia basketball history. He's our 39th all-time NBA draft pick and the eighth first round selection. Uh, previous high pick was number three by Dominique Wilkins in 1982. Uh, Dominique was chosen by Utah before he was traded to the Atlanta Hawks. It's Georgia's first first round pick since uh, Contavious Caldwell Pope in 2013. Contavious obviously just won an NBA title with the LA Lakers as a starter, averaged double digits in the NBA finals. Uh, Anthony is the sixth SEC player to be chosen number one and the fifth since 2010. Coach Crean is now one of only two coaches to have top five NBA draft picks at three schools. Of course, Dwayne Wade at Marquette was number five in 03. Victor Oladipo was number two at Indiana in 2013 and Anthony this year. And also of interest, Georgia had uh, top 10 picks in both the NFL and Major League Baseball drafts as well. Uh, offensive talk, tackle Anthony, I'm sorry, Andrew Thomas to the New York Giants at number four overall. Pitcher Emerson Hancock, number six overall to the Seattle Mariners. It's only the sixth time ever that a school has had top 10 picks in the NBA, NFL, and MLB drafts in the same year. And one more note, um, Anthony mentioned last night Donnell Gresham and talking to him. Donnell is, uh, was a grad transfer on our team last year um, who was from St. Paul and played at Creighton Durham Hall High School. Uh, if anybody in Minnesota uh, wants to reach out to, to uh, Donnell, I'll be more than happy to help facilitate that as well. Um, he and I have traded Texas this morning, so he expects he may get some some calls on that. So Donnell is a great kid. I, I would add that. What's that? Coach? Donnell is a great kid. Donnell is a great young man. I'm sorry, but he's a great young man. 
and they room together at times. Mike, did you ever see when was the last time that there were back-to-back -back picks at Georgia? Yes, I did. Um, and I will send that to everyone. Um, I get send it to me because I need it for recruiting, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> that, I, I need I need this recruiting intel, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, so it, it definitely. So <laughs> thanks, Coach. I'll make sure everybody thank else. Thank you. Can as well, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, participating in this. I appreciate that uh, that you got on, and um, we're looking forward to watching uh, the progress of him there. And um, you're going to enjoy it. It's going to take a little time, but you're going to enjoy it. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Tom. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you.